there's anyone here who has ever felt wronged unjustly? Has anybody ever felt that um, they've been blamed for something that was not their fault? Has anyone ever felt negative emotions rise up? Anger, resentment, frustration? Yeah. Yeah. So, how can we deal with this? Can there be reconciliation? Can there be a happy ending after all of that? And the answer is yes as spiritual teachers from every tradition have been teaching us for thousands of years, the key is forgiveness. As Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. And as it says in Luke, forgive and you shall be forgiven. It seems like forgiving and being forgiven are one energy flow. What a familiar concept. And we know it's a universal spiritual law that as a person sows, so they will reap. So we want to ask, in forgiving, who is set free? Well, of course the supposed offender is set free, but really, also, we are setting ourselves free from the negative situation, the negative emotions. We are claiming our own independence through forgiveness. We are no longer bound to that situation or those people. Do we want to maintain our resentment? Do we want to cultivate thoughts of revenge to get back at them? Do we want to be tied to this situation and these people who have caused us pain? It's a choice that's open to us. Or we can choose forgiveness, which is a decision. It leads to release and psychological transformation. And we know in unity, as we change our inner thinking and feeling, outer circumstances correspondingly change. Through forgiveness, we are freeing up emotional energy, which was formerly confined, and we can now use this energy positively. We are taking back our power from that situation and those individuals, which is actually a form of denial deny that that situation or those people have any power over us. And we can, in unity, many times we spend a lot of time on affirmations, but not so much on denials. But in such a situation that requires forgiveness, we can use denials, saying things like, you have no power here, be gone. I believe that's a quote from Glinda Goodwitch, of the North. <laughs> or we remember the favorite uh, denial of Amaya Frank in dealing with negative situations. To hell with it. <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps uh, to use a little bit more politically correct phraseology, we could say something like, I bless you and I release you to your highest good somewhere else. <laughs> Sometimes forgiving family and friends can be the hardest because they are the closest to us and have the ability to wound us most deeply. Of course there are many kinds of families. There are uh, obviously uh, genetic genealogical families perhaps that we grew up with um, there are maybe friends that we have known for many years. There can be uh, collegial families at work. There can be church families. Mm. Yes. There can be many kinds of injuries and hurt. But if we can get there, the answer is forgiveness. As an example of forgiveness, 
I would like to review the story of Joseph from the Hebrew Scriptures as told at the end of the book of Genesis. Joseph was the youngest of 12 sons of Jacob. Those 12 sons eventually fathered the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph was the youngest and his father's favorite, which caused some resentment with the other brothers. And his father gave Joseph a coat of many colors, which even aggravated the other brothers more. Joseph had a special gift for interpreting dreams, and he told his brothers one day he had a dream that there were 12 sheaves of wheat, and Joseph sheaf was in the middle, and the 11 other sheaves bowed down to the one in the middle. This caused even more resentment among the brothers. What, are we supposed to worship you? And later on, Joseph had another similar dream where he was a star in the middle of 11 other stars at the center. Well, the brothers had had about enough, and they decided they were going to get rid of Joseph. At first, they were going to kill him, but one of the brothers said, no, we don't want his blood on our hands. So they threw him in a pit, and when some traveling merchants came by on their way to Egypt, they sold Joseph into slavery. They took his coat of many colors, dipped it in blood, and gave it to Jacob, their father, who assumed that Joseph had been killed by some wild animal. Meanwhile, Joseph is carried into slavery in Egypt, where he's sold to a captain of the guard. Joseph is smart and he's capable, and eventually he rises in the household until he becomes second to the captain. <clears throat> While the captain is away from the house, the captain's wife takes a fancy to Joseph and tries to get him to participate with her in illicit behavior, but he will have none of it. One day, when everyone is gone, she approaches him and grabs onto him, insisting that he sleep with her, but he runs away, leaving his garment in her hand, whereupon she raises the alarm and accuses him of trying to rape her, and look, I have his garment as proof. The captain returns and is very angry, and Joseph is thrown into prison. I'm sure this is a really bad moment for Joseph. Okay, first I'm sold into slavery. Now I've been thrown into prison, and I haven't done anything wrong. Well, in prison, he's still smart, he's still capable, he becomes a trustee, he rises up until he becomes second in command to the jailer himself. He seems to have this ability to, um, to rise. While he's in prison, he meets two other prisoners. One is Pharaoh's butler, the one who serves him wine. And the other is one of Pharaoh's bakers. They have both fallen into his favor and been thrown into the prison. One night, each of them has a dream, and they don't know what it means. And Joseph is good with dreams. So, but he doesn't claim credit for it. He always says, the interpretation of dreams belongs to God. So the butler has a dream. There were three bunches of grapes. And I squeezed the grapes into wine glasses, and I served the wine to Pharaoh. Joseph said, this dream means that in three days you will be restored to your position, serving wine to the Pharaoh once again. Joseph says to him, when this happens, don't forget me back here in prison. <laughs> the baker, hearing this good interpretation, said, well, I had a dream too. I was walking along and I had three baskets on my head and each one of them there were baked goods and bread. And some birds came along and ate the baked goods in the top basket. What could this mean? And Joseph said, in three days, Pharaoh will call for you and execute you and hang up your body so the birds can eat it. Mm -hmm. So sure enough, in three days, that's exactly what happened. The butler is restored to court, and the baker is executed. So, metaphysically, what could we learn from these dreams? To drink 
more wine and eat less baked goods? No. I don't think so. That would be a foolish metaphysical interpretation. The butler, back in court, forgets all about Joseph until two years pass. One night, Pharaoh has two dreams that seem similar and they seem important to him, but he doesn't know what they mean. And he asks his counselors and his wise men and the priests and none of them can figure the dream out. And then the butler finally remembers, oh yeah, there was this guy back in prison that could interpret dreams. Pharaoh says, send for him. So Pharaoh's dreams were this. In the first dream, there are seven fat cattle, sleek and well-fed. And then there come seven lean, emaciated cattle, and they eat. They eat the eight fat ones, and yet they don't seem to be any bigger for having eaten them. And the second dream is similar. There are eight fat ears of corn, and then seven skinny, shriveled ears of corn come and eat the eight fat ones. Pharaoh wonders, what can this mean? Joseph says, there will be seven years of plenty, and there will be crops in abundance. And following that, there will be seven years of famine. So Egypt had better store up food in the good times to prepare for the bad times. So Pharaoh, who is well pleased, puts Joseph in charge of this project. And Egypt stores 20% of all of the crops from the seven good years. And then, sure enough, seven years later, there are seven years of famine. Well, the famine affects not only everybody in Egypt, but in surrounding lands too, including back in Canaan, Joseph's 11 brothers, who eventually are there starving and say, what should we do? If we stay here, we'll just starve. We hear Egypt has food. If we go there and they say, no, they won't help us, we'll starve anyway. But they might say yes. So they pack up all the money and treasures they have and trek to Egypt to ask if they can buy some grain. Guess who they are brought before? Joseph, yes. But they don't recognize him because years have passed and he's dressed as an Egyptian potentate and he's speaking with them through an interpreter at first. They don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. Hmm, what a great opportunity for revenge. How tempting to get back at them. But Joseph does not. He forgives them. He is glad to see them. He is reconciled with them and with their father. He sends them away, not only with grain, but with all of the money and treasures that they had brought with them. Hmm. And Joseph says, something very wise. He says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So even though a circumstance may seem negative at the time, it may be a path we have to take to get to something better. Mm. Are happy endings possible after errors, mistakes, bad situations? Yes, through forgiveness. Shakespeare also dealt with this same theme. At the beginning of his career, he did a lot of light comedies and history plays. Then in the middle career, he moved on to the tragedies, people who make mistakes, people who make errors, bad situations that happen, and calamities result. But then, at the very end of his career, his final four plays, like The Tempest and The Winter's Tale, he wondered, is it possible for people to make mistakes? Can bad things happen? And can, at the end, there still be a happy ending? Can there be reconciliation? And his answer was yes, and the key is forgiveness. There must be forgiveness for reconciliation to happen, and there to be a happy ending. Perhaps these situations are lessons or stepping stones that people need to have to get to where they are today and to get to something better. One writer has said, 
using our human intelligence to look at the world and try to understand something is like looking at the sky through a cardboard tube. There's no way that our human intelligence can understand the whole picture and how everything fits together. That's for spiritual intelligence. And before we leave Joseph and Dreams, I wanted to mention that Charles Fillmore, one of the co-founders of Unity, was very into dreams and dream interpretation. At one point, especially in his real estate career, he followed the directions he received in dreams about where to move to establish his real estate career. And he was told to move to Kansas City to start Unity in a dream. Uh, yes. So, in release, in forgiving and releasing negative emotions, it's a release, it's a denial, it's a cleansing, it's a healing. Charles Fillmore said, it is through forgiveness that spiritual healing is accomplished. And Jesus said, if you bring your gift to the altar when you stand praying, and there remember that you have ought against anyone, leave your gift before the altar and go on your way to first be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer your gift. One possible metaphysical interpretation is, if we are trying to enter into meditation, and there is some thought or relationship that is disturbing us and preventing us from offering our gift and going into meditation, that's probably a topic that we need to deal with. Jesus said, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes his son to shine, to rise, he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. We know that good and evil and just and unjust are judgments made in the human mind. God does not distinguish in that way, but sends the sun and the rain on everyone equally, and we can be likewise. It says in the 12-step program that we are supposed to operate on principle and not personality. That means we aren't just nice to people who are likable, but we are nice to everyone equally. And now, a personal story. I may have told this one before, but it's a great story, so I'm going to tell it again. <laughs> At work, I had a colleague who I found irritating. She rubbed me the wrong way. She was the kind of person, if I saw her coming down the sidewalk, I would cross the street and walk on the other sidewalk so I wouldn't have to interact with her. And I found that I was not the only one that had this reaction. Lots of people seemed to have this reaction to her. So I resolved that um, this was not the kind of person I wanted to be. I needed to make my sun shine on everyone equally. And I made the decision that I was going to go out of my way to be nice to her and to be friendly to her. If I was walking down the street on the other side, I would cross the street so I would encounter her. So I did at work and I was friendly and open and she was very responsive. And I suggested that um, I asked if she would like to talk sometime. And uh, she took me up on that opportunity, and we sat down, and we had a long talk. She did most of the talking, and I learned a lot, and I was glad I did it, because we can never know and understand a person without knowing their backstory and what they went through to get to where they are today. So that was a very beneficial for me, not only for what I learned, but it was a cleansing experience to get rid of those um, negative emotions. And then the next thing I knew, she took a transfer and she was gone like that. And so I was glad I took my opportunity when it was available. Yeah. It took a definite decision that I was going to change my behavior. Um, Fillmore said, we deny condemnation of others or ourselves. We do not condemn others and we do not condemn ourselves 
Uh oh, this gets us into the tricky realm of self-forgiveness. Mm. <laughs> what a tangled web that is. Yes, it's like being caught in a net or in a bush full of thorns. Have we unintentionally hurt another? Have we perhaps contributed to a negative situation? Were we doing the best that we knew how to do at the time? Were we overcome by fear or ignorance or confusion or selfishness or laziness? We have convicted ourselves in the court of our own minds and found ourselves guilty. How can we repair the damage that we feel we may have done? A vocabulary word, repentance, means a change of behavior, a change of mind and a change of behavior. When I was teaching and I caught my students in misbehavior, they would say, I'm sorry. I thought what they usually meant was, I'm sorry I got caught. <laughs> When they said, I'm sorry, my response was always, if you're really sorry, you'll change your behavior, which usually didn't happen. So we can blame it on their frontal lobes, which were not yet fully developed. Yes, the source of self-control and the uh, postponement of gratification. Yeah. So, Charles Fillmore said, repentance is a reversal of mind and heart. We may not be able to change the past situation, but we can change our emotions. We can release emotions which no longer serve us. We can say, I've learned the lesson, I've corrected my thinking and changed my behavior. I can now look at the situation objectively. I have let it go emotionally. I'm moving on. Now, perhaps other actions might be required. Apologies don't hurt if they're appropriate and won't make it worse. The same with amends, which can be tricky, but are sometimes a good solution. We give up guilt, we give up regret, self-recrimination, any sense that I am less than. I've never understood about Lent. I wasn't really raised Catholic. Um, but my Catholic friends would talk about what they were giving up for Lent, chocolate, ice cream, all these good things. And I thought, well, I want to give up guilt and self-recrimination and regret. I want to give up bad things. Why would I want to give up good things? Yeah. So we can regard these incidents as perhaps lessons to be learned, stepping stones that helped us to get to where we are today. So in closing, I wanted to ask three questions. Are we ready to forgive others? Are we ready to deny the power over us of negative emotions and behaviors? And are we ready to forgive ourselves? We remember that forgiving and being forgiven are one energy flow. And Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And so it is.
Joy of spirit in my heart. 